Tonight, I am so happy to welcome two amazing poets. First of all, uh, I'd like to welcome Simone Littledale Escobar, who we've known for quite a, while, a long time. Like, it's been like over 10 years. Over 10 years. Yeah. And that was at UVEC. Yeah. 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 Amazing. Simone, Simone is a poet, a multidisciplinary artist. She's actually an amazing ceramic artist, as well as an amazing poet. And she's an educator and she's living on the uh, living on the unceded Lekwungen territory. Her work explores ecological grief, ties to place, the natural world, and personal history, and draws strongly from both her Colombian Canadian heritage and her upbringing on the Pacific coast. Simone's work has been published in the Malahat Review, Prairie Fire, and the New Quarterly, and translated into Spanish. Please welcome Simone Littledale Escobar. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm excited to be here after such a long time. I was saying the last time I think I read here, I was 25 years old. <laughs> It was a while ago. This first poem is called Bat Dreams. Gentle creep of sleep, like frost across a quivering body. A thousand tiny brains dream. Sonoric rivers under starlight, ironclad tang of mosquito, crumbling of moth. The camber of one's voice returning and returning and fruit fallen open on the branch in the time of warm nights. But now it is the cold heart time, breath slowed in somnolence. They gather close, cling to the sculpted works of water in a temple to the hibernation of small things. This one is called a uh, syphonium, which is the technical term for a fig. Um, some of you may know that figs are pollinated by wasps, uh, some of you may be dismayed to learn this, that in every one of your figs, there is a wasp. I think it's kind of beautiful. This one's called Psychonium. A flower turned inward, milk-blooded, myriad buds blooming in darkness. The wasp mother dies, body torn in her search for sanctuary, as her children hatch into a lightless garden. Each wingless son gnaws his devotional pathway, so his sister may escape and succumbs the trees, every wow. sweetening droop, a reliquary housing little ghosts. July. Cleaning the junkyard, you shift a nest of swallows. The parents cannot find it. The naked chicks die within the hour. Some trees scream as they fall and fireweed leaps soon after. Punctuation to a sound that you, with your 3M orange foam earplugs, do not hear. King Tide. Thick booted over slick rock, skeins of eelgrass and rockweed steps tentative, the wince and crush of barnacles underfoot. Headlamp shrinks pupils to pinpricks, small fish shunning the shadow of the invertebrates collector with his white plastic bucket. Leading us between tide pools, abrupt windows into a jeweled sea in miniature, barrelin anemones, chitin cabochons, ochre stars with pearl studded skin. A nudibranch creeps across the still skin of the water suspended upside down opalescent gills drifting dreamlike against a filigree of coral and algae. The trance is broken by a sudden rush of cold foam overfoot, the dark sea reaching salted tendrils into boots, making tide pools of us too. Never turn your back to the sea, the collector chides, plucks whelks like fruit from the rock, his eyes like limpet shells in the gloom. This one is called uh, Zugenruhe, which is a term, a German term that means the need or instinct to migrate or a kind of restlessness. The prairie breathes like a beast, 
the simmering of insects, the bend and swell of June grass in a southwester. Loose stones ping and drum off the chassis, windows cracked just enough to keep you awake, eyes thorny from staring down endless reams of road. Grasshoppers in their thousands hobble across gravel highways, crushed under wheel, guts streaked across the windscreen. Larks and long spurs browse ditches spilling with prairie sunflowers, tail flashing white as they flush like sparks in your wake. Pull off to stretch and shake that woolen feeling of exhaustion. Kick the tires to make sure they're good. As night hawks teetering on knife point wings, cut the gloom above a barn gone gray and slanted, a ghost ship among swells of ripening wheat. The ditch fills with butterflies settling for sleep and the shriek of a fox in the next field reminds you, you must make medicine hat by nightfall. <clears throat> Essential travel. It is at ebb tide, with a westerly slicing the leaden water, pale light unseeming the horizon, at the hangnail of beach where the wild grasses end and the driftwood flenses down to gray strips, where 600 snow geese tuck their beaks against blood bitter cold, white lines of them like teeth among the reeds. The geese lift into the wind as you thud and stumble across packed sand pulling into skeins with a staccato of clattering wings. Soon the swelling days will turn them northward and some heavy coal in your, the back of your skull asks if you can ever return home in a way that matters. As you leave, there is only the sharp high cry of geese and the rattle of empty stalks, seeds long scattered. Where we go fishing, there is a three-legged bear who shows up once a year. Um, I'm not sure how he lost the leg, but he shows up every year on the side of the estuary and he seems to be doing fine. So I wrote uh, a poem about him. As I slip a knife along a pink's ribs, he emerges, a look across the estuary. A gate, a tipping half low, left forelimb gone at the elbow, stump scar half furred. He is thin, peak shouldered and hollow around the face. Nostrils quiver at the blood seeping into my side of the creek. We watch each other a long time. Heads of salmon waver underwater, eyes emptied by picking ravens. I wipe the knife on my pants, scales trailing the blade. The sound of ebb tide tumbling river stone, the glut of roe in my hand going cold. This one is called uh, Clear Cut Country. Sing to me a song of felling and the dry, much disturbed soil of cut blocks. You find your own voice again, snagged in salmonberry thorns. Quench the dust road parched with rain, gleaned from the brush and battered late season nutka rose. Did you have that dream again? Your sleep disturbed by night jars and the black dog who also dreams of bears. Years from now, you'll remember splintered roots, poor footing, fragrant fireweed. That place where the logging road hairpins up, where you found the broken, shining leg bones of a deer. The calligraphy of sinew, as if some scribe had been leaving a message in a wild and furtive script, only to be suddenly interrupted. Um, a bathysphere is an early form of a um, submarine, basically a do an old diving bell. This one is called bathysphere. The family gathers over plum cake and decaf to talk again about scheduling her death. She used to say she'd walk into the sea once she felt the slow gnaw of Alzheimer's within her skull. My swim, she called it. This was before it was all legal, before consults, consent forms, 
the humane prick of a needle, before her mind began to drown. Now her eyes follow speech across the table, tapping red varnished nail against her teacup, an ocean unto herself. I have never seen my grandmother touch the sea. She holds her hand, my hand in her soft brown fingers, her rings now so loose. She says we have to play Manzanero at the funeral. She says this eight times. My brother films us all laughing, morbid Colombians that we are, plays back the video on a cracked phone screen, the sound muffled as if underwater, and she laughs too. I think of her old wish to drift like kelp in the freezing water, to empty her lungs, to tuck her legs and sink. This is my last poem. It is called Shrike. The chase is a monochrome bolt through the cold. Downy woodpecker bursts from the bramble, her terror a shrill shard. The shrike dives her down amongst the tangle, rose hips jangle in their crust of ice. Again, the birds burst into the clear and again, each sprint thinning endurance, dime turn and dive. On these fields, it is death and life and death. A last thrash, the shrike cuts cover like a razor. The woodpecker's cries carried on steam. Sound dies, now only the numb, dank smell of fallow field, the sharp shot crack of ice in the silence. Thank you all so much. Wow, thank you so much, Simone. It was amazing to hear your poetry. <laughs> it's so fabulous. I can't wait till you put this up in a book. It's, it's in the works. It's in the works. Yay, yeah, we'll have you back to launch it. Oh, gorgeous work. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> Jess Husti, Chiwogila is a parent, writer, and grassroots activist with health, soul, and mixed settler ancestry. They serve their community as an herbalist, a land-based educator alongside broader work in the nonprofit and philanthropic sectors. They're inspired and guided by relationship with their homelands, their extended family, and their non-human kin. And they are committed to raising their children in, in a similar framework of kinship and land love. They reside and thrive in their unceded ancestral territory in the community of Balabala, BC. And the new collection, Crushed Wild Mint, was recently listed for four big awards. The Gerald Lampert Award, the Pat Lauther Memorial Award, the Dorothy Livesdale Poetry Prize, and the Bill Duffy Booksellers' Choice Award. Please welcome Jess Hustie. Hey, Jessica. Can everybody hear me okay? I don't do well with microphones. <laughs> um, thank you so much for welcoming me here, for coming out this evening. Uh, I was sharing, I did, I did a reading this afternoon at um, James Bay New Horizons, and I was sharing that, you know, because I live in such a geographically remote place, I often don't feel like I have an immediate sense of community around poetry and writing, and so it's really beautiful when I have the opportunity to be in the company of people who write and read and enjoy this too. Um, the first poem that I want to share is one that I like to share by way of introduction. I live in Bella Bella. It's on the outer central coast. I live right on the water. Never learned to drive a car. I drive a boat. Mm -hmm. um, and the ocean is such a central part of my life. And so often when I'm traveling to share my work, I like to share this poem near shore prayer uh, as a way of introducing myself. This is a prayer that extends in the direction of the ocean. It is not a story. Nothing is apocryphal in prayer. You taught me that water is the most practiced lapidary, that it can shape 
and polish all precious things, not just stone, heart and breath, bone and grief. Through you, I know that water has mastered us. Ocean, as I step into you, I ask that you seek out what is precious in me. Etch it with your salt fingers and smooth it against the dip and rise of your sleeping chest. Make me curious about what is absent. Let me redefine wholeness by what is left behind when your hands are lifted away from my body when you've taken what is no longer mine to carry. I forgot um, my reading copy of my book. <laughs> so my post-its in it. So I'm flipping through trying to remember what I wanted to read. Um, I had the beautiful experience of being here in Victoria to launch my book in October when it came out and was at UVic and um, had a really lovely reading and afterward a young woman came up to me and she was a little bit vexed and she had read my book and she said to me um, you read a lot of poems but you didn't read any love poems why why didn't you read any love poems <laughs> uh, so I try to be conscious of, of front loading at least one love poem when I'm <laughs> what I'm sharing this one is uh one of my favorites from the book, it's called Wilderness. I will love you into the grave, yours or mine. I say this not to be ghoulish, but with the simple authority of crushed mint or migratory birds arriving and departing. This is dependent on nothing. It is without conditions. I will love you into the grave, yours or mine. If yours, I will plant wild roses at your feet and tell stories to the sweet insects that chatter against your bones beneath the black earth. I will make them reckon with your goodness and we will tally up together the enormity of your loving. I will love you into the grave, yours or mine. If mine, I will go to it quietly like an animal to the wakeless forest when its time has come. I will have nothing left to ask for. I will have come home and home again every day of my life to rest in the wilderness of your love. <laughs> Um, is anyone here familiar with the late Heisla elder Cecil Paul? Yeah, I see some heads nodding. Um, Cecil was a really beautiful human being. For those of you who, who don't know of him and know of his legacy, he's he was from um, the Heisla nation up in Kitimat. There are a couple of really beautiful books that I encourage you to check out. <laughs> Uh, one is called Stories from the Magic Canoe, which is stories from his life that he shared. And the other, I think, is called Following the Good River, uh, which is a, a biography of Cecil. He was an incredible advocate for land and language and culture, a huge inspiration to me. Um, if you'll indulge a story, I was sharing this afternoon that um, Cecil has this, like, had this just formidable belief that you could speak good things into the world. And he had very strong convictions. And in 2016, he called me up because we were expecting um, a royal visit at Bella Bella. We were expecting Will and Kate to come to Bella Bella for a royal visit. <laughs> and I was in Vancouver and I was on a busy street and my phone rang and it was a number that I didn't recognize. And when I answered it, there was a quiet voice on the other end. So I ducked into an alley and it turned out it was Cecil. And he called me up and said, hey, you know, Will and Kate are coming to Bella Bella. And I really think that his granny needs to apologize for colonization. So do you think that you could talk to Will and ask him to talk to his granny and get her to apologize? <laughs> Cecil was not a man that you said no to. Um, as it would later transpire, Cecil screened me out of being anywhere close to Will and Kate. Um, but I did write a letter in which I snuck into a gift basket for him and I hope he shared with his, his granny. Uh, although I don't think an apology was forthcoming before she died. But that was just the beauty of Cecil. He just had this really deep conviction and this belief that 
everyone around you is an ally. You just you just had to find the right message in the right moment. Um, he passed away a few years ago, and when he passed away, I wrote a series of poems, sort of for him, sort of about him. But if you if you met him, uh, there were four questions that he would often ask as a way of getting to know you. He would ask, "Who are you? Who are you really? Why are you here?" And what are you for? Who are you? Some of us are struggling to iterate the void. Some have felt its edges and learned to gently break the call, believing then that they've invented rivers, though the rivers have always been with us to bind our grief, to make us good. Some of us know that our bones are stones in a riverbed that our bodies are defined by embankments that sway with our breath. Some are softened and rounded by this knowing, leaning into what erodes us until our every atom is a reflection in the gleaming of the water. Who are you really? There is hurt in this world. Only a river can make it right. If you carry the hard shape of unknowing snagged between your collarbones, the river will flow around it and the water will lift it away. You might think a river deals only in intangibles, but truthfully, it could strip your body down to the barest nutrients if you let it. It could rebuild you bone by bone and stone by stone. There is loss in the world. Only a river can make it right. When you uncover your wound and give it to the river, like the belly of a resting gull, like an alder leaf, like any curling and fragile thing that proves the water's surface is taut, the river washes it bright and clean. You have a choice then, clasp your hand over the wound or know deeply that you are fertile and well-watered earth worthy of planting seed then. Why are you here? There are mornings when the light is heavy and the weight of it holds us to the ground. There's only one direction then, one way for the river to flow, the rain to fall down. There are mornings when all things lean toward the light and the weight of it gives us deep roots. You became the light and you gifted us your multitude of directionality. You are glint water, movement, your soil, taproot, stone. You are living, most of all, in your leaving. You are the current that carries medicine to us and through us, and you are the gleam we stretch toward. No river is a monument, not even in the eager eyes of gulls and ravens at the slow exhale of spawning time, but all rivers in their way are monumental. What are you for? There are four things about you that make my rib cage bloom like wild aster, trusting in the sun, the quietness of your arrival, and the power of what you bring with you in your hands like fir bark split from the trunk. I buried my face in the river, breath held, eyes open. When I stood upright, I learned I could navigate by birdsong and see love like landmarks. I watched loss drift seaward. The water makes it light. I watched grief carry the east. It floats in the hush and chill. But mostly, I was staggered by the blessings that blossomed in the morning air. There are four things about you that make my rib cage crack like stone from the roots and the rainwater of your love. The quietness of your departure and the power of what you leave behind. You came before, and like all rivers, you will constantly and softly return. When I was writing a lot of the poems for this collection, and when I was going through the editing process, I had the really beautiful gift of being one of the caretakers of my grandmother who was in her final year, she's passed away uh, since before the book came out. Um, she was a really 
formative influence in my life. I have, I have an aunt here. There are several people in this room who knew her and loved her. And she was a really beautiful, kind, generous beam of light. Probably all of us know someone who is that, and that was my grandmother. And uh, it was a really beautiful and grounding experience for me to do so much of the work for this collection while I was sitting in her living room while she was napping in the sun in her chair. And so a lot of the poems in this book are, are love poems to my granny. Uh, or they're for her or about her. And this series of poems is called Luaf. Luaf means ghost. These are the poems I write in my grandmother's kitchen. Set out four cups of tea, one for each of us, one for the guest who may soon, we hope, cross the threshold, and one for the ghosts who feel safe here. Everyone is nourished in this place. These are the poems I write in my grandmother's bedroom. What's on the walls or between the walls is of no real consequence to us. What makes this space safe is love who with scarred and swollen knuckles turns away hardness at the door and gently closes it behind us again. These are the poems I write in my grandmother's living room. You must always know who needs a place to rest. You must always know who might be hungry. These are the poems I write in my grandmother's attic. Every exhale expended in this house is stacked in here, this wooden lung, this library of breath. Snorts of anger scoring the wood erratically as though sharp cornered boxes and blunt furniture were tossed in here. Sighs of pleasure, smoothing the grain to a high gleam, the whole place polished by held breaths, belatedly let go. These are the poems I write in my grandmother's garden. Which one is the prayer? The crocus, the lily, or the tenacious weed? Which one is the answer? The crimson rhubarb casting broad shadows, the feral blackberry pushing up from underneath the gate. These are the poems I write in my grandmother's absence. Your house is full of little altars, your dresser, your windowsill, but you are the prayer, the flower. You are the love. You are the guest we will wait for until we are ghosts. You are the ghost we nourish. Um, it's been really beautiful being here in Victoria and seeing everything that is blooming. We're a little behind up in Bella Bella. It's a little, little takes a little longer for spring to arrive. Um, but I have a poem called Spring, so I thought I would read it just in celebration of uh, being here and getting to see all the cherry blossoms. Lift up your chin and drop your shoulders away from your ears. Take one deep breath for your ancestors, one for yourself, and one for the world yet to come. It is permissible to come to this work hesitant, tired, wounded. In spring, even the bitterest greens resolve toward eventual sweetness. Take one breath for rest, another for regeneration. We don't criticize the tight buds for asking that their needs be met before they unfurl into leaves and blooms. Let tentative bird song become a clamor. Let leaves become broad and skies expansive as you stretch your weary back, pull back your shoulders. Let everything you need collide into the crest of your waiting chest as you breathe. How are folks feeling? Those are all the poems that I picked out. I could read another one or two if you want to. Has anybody here read the book and have a particular request? Yeah. I never know where things are in my own book. Transformation. Transformation is an old one. Uh, almost all of the the 
poems in this book I wrote in the sort of year before the manuscript was due, and they're just a couple of holdovers of older work that made it in, and this is one of them. Transformation. There are mornings when I feel a non-specific loneliness sitting soft and heavy in my bones, hushing my surroundings with the weight of estuary silt and the stillness of salt. I'd prefer the companionship of my other forms, my animal selves, the ones I could speak into being if I was nimble as an ancestor. I can't call that power down, nor can I sit with the silence of my only self. I imagine the stubble of pin feathers, the different arc of my bones if they bent to the posture of a carnivore. I grieve for the lost bodies, the self that is singular, that can never become the community one ancestor might have embodied, that can never transform. But then there is my grandmother with her strong hands and their sedge root veins, hands that have skinned hundreds, thousands of ducks in her lifetime. When she sends me those ducks now to prepare with patience and a little grace from the birds, my hands no longer cramp as I slip the skin and feathers away from the meat. The steam from their guts and the cool air makes it easy to imagine the truth of how my ancestors transformed, less an act of becoming and more an act of believing, slipping out of ourselves and into ourselves, an act sharp and sweet as the smell of blood and half-digested grass. I understand that the heart is where you hold your power and the hands are where you hold your sacredness. And with wild meat on your tongue, you might even remember the animals you become in your dreams. And the tangle of veins in my hands that slip between the fat and the meat, between the copper and the sweetness, must match the tangle of roots in an estuary somewhere. If I carry a likeness of some small part of my homeland in my body, then I hold the possibility that the imprint of each wolf or bird or small careful creature that walks across it may be written on my heart, and that is enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, crushed wild mint. I love the smell of crushed wild mint. <laughs> How do you appease a spirit? Braid your hair, then ask that spirit how it needs to be loved. If you are someone who feeds the living, ask yourself how to nourish a ghost. Set three places at the table for the two of you and for grief. Crush wild mint and put it in your pockets, in your hair, in a bowl on the table. Let the scent cleanse grief like smoke, like cedar, like tenderness. Any other requests? Yeah. Um, the last section of my book is a series of poems about two mountains uh, in our territory, uh, Kuwagami and Munskumpli. So like lots of cultures, we have a flood story and part of our flood story is that our people were saved by mountains and many went up Kuwagami, the taller mountain, uh, and some went up Munskumpli and realized that Munskumpli wasn't high enough to be above the flood waters. And so according to our oral history, Munskumpli called out to Kuwagami, the taller mountain, and asked for a little bit of his height. So he tossed some of his height over to men's company so that people could be, be up above the floodwaters. And I've climbed both of those mountains, Kwagami more than men's company. And uh, this series of poems is a series of prayers and reflections and silly notes on how to climb chaotic mountains and be in relationship with big beings of stone. Maybe I'll read the first poem, which is called Prayer. Creator, go before us in all things, especially small things. 
Every inch you carve from the darkness is an inch where we can swell into the light. Take the terrible holiness of our bodies and make us consumable. Make us each into a sacred feast. I pray for the flood and I pray to be spared by the flood. I pray for the flood and I pray that the flood will never come. I pray for the blessedness of erasure. And then there's also a, a closing prayer, which is creator, go before us in all things, especially small things. Every inch of light you gift us teaches us how to decay the shadows. Every inch of water you gift us teaches us how to float without drifting. The flood has come and we have survived the flood. The flood may come again and we will survive it again. I pray for the blessedness of perpetual memory. I'm feeling good. Read another one if you want. Clearly, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't prepare it. Last one. Final one. Okay, sure. Last one. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. You okay with like a, a medium length one? Yeah. Okay. I have a series called Aunties. They're really like. So the first one goes We are here to speak with love of what is overlooked. We are here to speak with tenderness of what is overladen. We are here to hold our palms at the base of a cluster of fiddleheads and say, your tight spirals are beautiful, but so is the trust with which you unfurl. Let us be the roots. Let us be the light. Let us be what stretches broad and vital in between. Two, who is at your back? I bring my ancestors in all their humanity. You bring yours. While we dislodge our grief with sacred laughter, lean into one another like the river to the bank. Are our ancestors laughing too? Are our great grannies and aunties and mothers who have gone on ahead, sitting side by side in the sunshine at the river, holding and upholding each other the same way you are present for me? Three. You invite me to feed my softness. You invite me to revolutionary rest. Your own softness makes this permissible. The sweetness and grace of your emergence from respite transformed. I wanted to hold myself in the shape of your strength, but you call me to recognize the strength I did not see in myself. The gentleness, the seed relaxing into good soil, the power of a root asking for nourishment without apology. Four, as I stand up and speak to my good work in this life, I will continue to gesture to the space where you once stood beside me. This is to acknowledge the strength you have given me. When I speak to what gives me power, my answer will include a blessing of your ancestors for bringing your abundant gifts into this world that we share. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see you guys.